I'm so excited to welcome onto the first time facilitator podcast, Kate Pearden. Kate, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Leanne. It's great to meet a fellow uh, Bris Vegas, not Bris Vegasite, Bris Brisbaneite. I don't know what they are. Uh, Bris Vegas party animal. Brisvarian. Look, I think, I think people are open. I love that. Uh, Kate, I, you've got a really interesting story into how you discovered the world um, of facilitation and visuals as well. So I wonder if you could share that with our listeners to kick off. Sure. Uh, look, how I got into facilitation was more so by chance. Um, it was a vehicle of how I could get in contact with more people and have a greater impact. And it's similar to the story of visuals. So my background is uh, human resources. And so I kind of went through the standard HR generalist type role and got into learning to development. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. Um, but I had this thought that to be sort of business and professional, the thing that I needed to do was an MBA. <laughs> so I went and did that and ticked that off a list and got myself into senior leadership positions and was in an executive team and working with a board. And I feel like I would kind of got uh, the experience and the knowledge to get me to those positions. And I had this real light bulb moment of, okay, well, this is, this has kind of got me in the door, but I've missed the point. The point is people. And mm -hmm. no matter where I was and who I was working with, it was all about people and interactions with people. And the better I could understand people and the better I could interact with people and help people interact with each other, that was where I was going to make the difference. And that's how I started to get into coaching. And I studied positive psychology and positive psychology and leadership. And that became the real pivotal moment for then how I got into facilitation because it was a way that I could help people understand themselves and work with each other better. And that had a bigger impact. It's first of all, let's talk about the, the MBA because you've worked in learning and development <laughs> as well. And I, I worked for an engineering company and I think 90% of the people there would say, my next progression is I need to do an MBA. And I was mm -hmm. like, I, I kind of, um, yeah, I was like pushing back on that, but it just seems like such a common uh, way to grow. It just seems like the most conventional route. I'm sure it's fantastic, but you then, so this point where you realized, oh, it's all about the people. When did that, was there a sort of a moment where it dawned on you or it's like, I'm trying to do these things. I'm following things by the book, but it isn't landing. Like what was it in particular that made you realize, oh, there's a gap here that um, now I need to really focus on the side of the side of the business. Um, look, if I rewound sort of 10, 15 years, I would say I was a really technical person. I was really black and white and I was really proud that I only had two or three emotions. <laughs> um, and I would say that proudly, like I was like glad, mad, sad. What about bad? And that was, that yeah. was, yeah, yeah, not so much bad, but that yeah. was a badge that I would wear. Wow. Um, and it was interesting that through the MBA, because part of that was also understanding. You had to do a leadership development plan and understand how you work. And I didn't realise that I didn't get it. Mm. I didn't realise that I hadn't really developed that understanding of myself. So therefore, how could I understand other people? And I think having that insight and being someone that was that way enables me to really understand what other people are going through. And how you just don't know unless you, until you know, or until you see it, or until someone shows you, until you experience it. Completely. It's like, I'm, I'm really just seeing that that ladder of learning, of course, like the unconscious incompetence, like you don't even yeah. know, you're not even aware yet. It's kind of scary when you, well, you don't know because so, so it's fine. It's a happy place to be, as you said. And then it's usually some type of intervention or something happens where it just opens up that awareness. And then suddenly you've got this gap between where you currently are and where you'd like to be as well. Now, Kate, something that I'm extremely envious of as I look at your background is how great you are at drawing and capturing things visually. It's kind of like a running joke in all of my workshops. When I bring out my iPad, I start drawing on it. People can't read my writing and I kind of, <laughs> it's like maybe I'll do it to reduce my status, but I like every time I'm like, I need to get better at this. Um, what drew you so much to the visual component of facilitation? Uh, again, that was by accident. Mm -hmm. Um, someone had a workshop and they said, oh, would you like to come along? It's all about um, using visuals. I was like, oh, I'd like to learn how to draw. Yeah, I'll come along. Um, so I had failed high school art. Actually, I didn't even get past like, the, the grade eight art because I was terrible. 
And I remember coming home and I was terrified to tell my dad that I had failed something. And his response, and I still remember to this day, so obviously it had an impact on me. He's like, well, it's not like you're going to use that anyway, like in your career. So that's fine. And it's so ironic that now it is one of the best vehicles that I've got for engagement is visuals. <laughs> so I, I guess I tell that story to reinforce that it's not about skill. Mm. But again, you don't know that until you actually are shown that it's not about skill. So what is it about then if it's not skill or natural talent? And which is good because my year eight art teacher like completely uh, I remember it was like a clay type of sculpture and he's like that's terrible in front of the whole class <laughs> I haven't touched clay since <laughs> so I need to like break that mindset um if it's not about skill then um what are visuals about so the thing that I learned was um about self-efficacy so the idea that you already know what visuals are without being taught so um one of the activities that I often talk about is if you were to draw um, a clock, how would you draw it? Everyone in the room draws it the same way. It's a circle and it has got, you know, the north, south, east and west on it and some hands. Everyone knows it's a clock. If you say, okay, a coffee cup, how would you draw it? Interestingly, people don't draw a takeaway coffee cup. Everyone would draw a cup and a saucer with the handle on the right-hand side and two or three steam lines above. And this is like 95% of a group that has never been taught how to draw so in our mind, we already have this idea of what icons are. Mm. And so like a lot of other facilitation or learning, it's how to help people untap what you already have instead of teaching you something new. So the way I use visuals in a workshop, um, people that have worked with me, I will show them. You'll notice it's only about the same 10, 10 same icons I use over and over and the same banner. There's not a lot of skill in what I do but I slow it down and I write it a little bit neater than the probably average person. It's a cheat for a flip chart. Mm. Um, and I use the same icons. So I just have a cheat sheet. But what's interesting is no one cares because they're intrigued about what's going on. As soon as you pick up a pen, people go, oh, something yes. different. And even though it takes that moment longer, it's the anticipation that builds up that actually creates extra memory as well. That is so smart because you're right. I'm that type of person that would just like hurriedly try to get it done because I want people to see it straight away. And then mm -hmm. as a result, like no straight lines, it's terrible. Um, that is really interesting. So slowing down, it actually increases the anticipation of what's to come. And you think about the different ways people learn. Um, I think people are very familiar with like there's people that are comfortable to learn audio, people that are visual and kinesthetic. So it's the actual doing of things. So your, your art teacher with doing the clay. <laughs> that mean kinesthetic learning um, about 60% of people are visual about 30% auditory and the rest is um, kinesthetic so learning with your hands like actually doing something uh, and or reading text so if in a conversation or a workshop that I'm facilitating if someone says an idea you're like huh that's an interesting idea pick up a pen and I draw something very simple because I've said it because I've drawn it. So I said that I've got the auditory, I've drawn it, I've got the visual. Mm. And then because they've watched me draw it, it's almost like having the kinesthetic as well. Mm. And the ability for the mind to remember that because they've experienced it is so much better than having something come straight up on a, a slideshow or just the words or hurriedly trying to write it down. Yeah. Um, I've been in meetings where someone's had an idea and everyone, like we all are looking quite glazed at this person going, what does that actually mean? And they grab a whiteboard marker, they step up and they draw it and it, it, every, it just comes alive and everyone like yeah. completely understands. So it's interesting. Yeah. I, um, every time I have conversations like this, it, it really reminds me like I need to get this skill, but I, I do like, I maybe I'll make a vow on this podcast that I will learn like just even just 10 icons. Um, let's talk about memory retention as well. I know that's something um, that's really important to you. So in terms of memory, we can see it. So it's not like a PowerPoint slide that disappears, but you've also used this outside of the workshop to retain things in your memory. Um, can you yeah. share that with our, with our listeners? Absolutely. Um, so unless people know me very well, mm. um, they probably don't realise that I have had um, a brain injury. Um, so when Leanne talks about uh, memory, this is, has been a huge impact on me. 
Um, so in 2018, I had what's called a vertebral artery dissection. That's when the, one of the arteries that takes blood to your brain splits. It was just spontaneous and a blood clot to the brain. So it was a small stroke. Oh my gosh. Um, so the realization of the impact of that took a while to understand, uh, but it impacted my memory. Um, I wasn't able to do probably like 95% of the things I was normally able to do. So I wasn't able to work for about six months. Um, walking 10 meters was a big victory. Um, like just making a sandwich, something really simple is like how, with the order that you put bread and then the things inside the sandwich. And then like, that was really challenging for me. Mm. And it seems crazy to be having this conversation and like to believe that that's um, like the everyday things was a big struggle. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that really helped me was how do I use visuals to help with my memory? Um, so having this knowledge was wonderful because it was in my long-term memory. I knew how to access it. Yeah. Um, but I knew that like the short-term memory that we have is kind of like a whiteboard. It's only about 20 minutes. And then the brain decides, is it useful or not useful? Does it go into long-term memory or do I clear the whiteboard? So one of my challenges was my whiteboard was like, one minute how do I capture things work out what's useful how do I capture it and increase like how do I store information and then how do I decide what's useful to then reuse um so a really practical example is I knew that every day I had to have a certain set of medication but some things it was every four hours one was once a day one was after food and to try and work that out every day was super challenging I think probably for the average person but challenging for someone that couldn't remember something two minutes later yeah and so I would use a visual and I would map out like with pictures what I needed to do and when and then with my daily plan it would also have like what a walk would be um when to eat because I couldn't remember if I'd eaten or not um and then I would have a visual of what I had to do that day and then I would tick it off wow. and by using a visual it meant that I was able to retain the information a lot better than just using a word and it was easier to attach to. And so like having my own ex personal experiences of how to be able to use this in rehabilitation has really changed then how do I use it to help other people learn mm -hmm. and like do it in a fun, practical way um, and make it useful as opposed to something that like worrying that I'm not going to get the right picture or it's not going to be the right spelling or it's not going to be um, yeah, all the things that sort of hold us back from using them just to think that this is a vehicle that can help not only me but can help people in my workshops or the people that I work with. Oh my goodness that's such a thank you for sharing that story I just yeah gosh imagine and like your transformation and, and looking at you now is it's so it's so hard to believe that was what you were going through three years ago and I often find, um, yeah, I think it was like last year, I was getting really stuck on a problem and I was, I was on my computer and I was scrolling down this, down the screen and I was like, Leanne, you're a facilitator. What would you do in the situation? I was like, well, I'd grab post-it notes. I'd tell everyone to like <laughs> put a timer on. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that for myself. And I think um, what you're just demonstrating is what I'm sort of sharing is that we have all these skills that we use for our groups, but if we can use it on ourselves, as like a micro skill. I mean, that's the best thing. If it works for us at you know, N equals one, maybe there's a possibility we'll work with the group too. Um, so what type of workshops are you, are you running at the moment? Who do you, who do you work with? What kind of um, outcomes do you like to drive? Uh, uh, as part my, of, yeah. Yeah. My hands down favorite thing is leadership development. Mm -hmm. um, so working with a group that would be like over 12 month periods, because there's the growth that can happen over that period of time is unbelievable. Mm. Um, sort of one-offs when it is, uh, like executive teams is not so common. I find that often it'll be a three months or six months that I'll work with a group. Um, and I'm a lot more particular now about who I work with and how I work with them because I'm keen on this growth journey. And it takes a couple of times to set up the psychological safety to get people comfortable with each other. And you just kind of crack it open for growth and then it's done. Yes. <laughs> and only yeah. so much learning happens in the room like the learning happens afterwards so how to be able to when the group comes back again how to be able to debrief and put some tangibility on so what did you take how did how did you apply that and what did that mean mm. um, and let's make that tangible so then you can see what it looks like and then do something with it moving forward 
And how do you go with, because I think we're all, all of us, like I, I shouldn't generalize, but I hear this from many facilitators I talk to is like, yeah, as you said, a client will call up and say, yeah, we're just after the one-off. And then Kate, you and I, we know it's like a long-term thing to make any type of change. Um, how do you go about sort of influencing back? Is it just sharing of case, case studies of things that you've done before? Like, how do you influence a client to say, no, this, we need to invest more time and effort and money into this? That's a wonderful question and probably not something I have thought specifically about. If I think about when I meet with clients and really talk about what do you want to get out from this, I will talk about, okay, in 12 months, what does this actually look like? What, what are the tangible things that are happening? How will we know it's happening? What I will talk about in 12 months, I will talk about in three years. So I'm um, anchoring a future state and then say, well, how, what are the things to, to get there? And really mapping out how that could work because often people don't know until they see it. Mm. So if people come through a referral from someone else, um, often they'll say, I don't know why I need to work with you, but there's something about someone that's worked with you and they've just said that you just need to talk to Kate. <laughs> okay, that's not so helpful, but sure. <laughs> Let's have a look about what that would look like. Mm. Um, and I think that's probably the helpful thing is the idea that clients always right means that if they want one workshop, it's one workshop. And maybe that is what is the in mm. for them to be opened up. If I think about when I started my MBA, no way would I have thought that I was doing this. I just don't know what I don't know. So as you were talking about the unconscious, help, help people see that, help map it out, like how this could work. How is it that, like, not just what the features, what are the benefits? Mm. How does this play out in their lives? How is the multiplier effect of what you're doing going to happen to the company? Mm. And I like that connection to uh, what the tangible outcome is. I think a lot of the time as facilitators, we're so, we love the process. So it's like opening up these discussions. And But the, uh, the next question has to be so that what happens? Like what is the result yeah. of doing that rather than like talking in these like intangible concepts because we so geek out on like the dialogue yeah. <laughs> and like democratizing the conversation that like, it doesn't matter, like the client's like, what does that even mean? So it's yeah. all about that, that, that oh. connection. And even that specific question I will ask, and sometimes with that tone, be like, okay, so we've had this, we've done this wonderful experience, everyone's feeling like that's great. So what? Mm-hmm. Why should anyone care? Be like, whoa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, you were supposed to be like telling us why this is great. But, uh, yeah, I can tell you why it's great, but I want to know like what is it for you? Mm-hmm. And being okay that that might mean that I get rejected and the comfort in that is part of the process I think as a facilitator yeah like just well that's what we do we, we want to open up those conversations so what you're doing there is actually again role modeling um but and I, I also find that also putting the objection out to the world nice and early is not a bad thing because it's kind of like it was, you just skirt around these sort of issues and it's like let's just put it out there and talk about it um yeah. And, and if you're the one that does that, then it seems like, oh, wow, this person's pretty authentic and real. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's, <laughs> let's talk about your, um, your process from becoming a first time facilitator. So where did you, were you running workshops internally um, in the roles that you were in? And then you got the confidence to then jump out on your own? Like, how did you get your start? Spot on. I was doing internal workshops and there was, there's comfort with people that know you. There's also, it's a bit scary when people know you. Yeah. But it did allow me to cut my teeth and really see, okay, well, this is this is something that I can do. And I really wanted to challenge myself by starting my own business. Is it just that these people know me? Like if I go into an environment where no one knows me, they don't know a background, I'm going in cold, can I still create this environment for people to learn? Mm. And that became almost a personal challenge for me. And how's, how long have you been in business? Uh, four years. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, but yeah it's, it's so fun to sort of re-engineer that whole journey of, um, of leaving a job. I'm a year behind you. And I, I think I had similar reasons. I was like, okay, I, could, I think my thing was I've done everything I can within this organisation in terms of like had some great opportunities and I think it's just time to test this out and see um, – well, first of all, I was actually really surprised. And this is probably not a surprise to anyone. Do you find like anytime you work with a leader, leadership or team in any industry, any size business, it's always like very similar problems that you're working with, isn't it? Is, 
That is one of the great things about getting an insight to executive teams and leadership teams and all different businesses. And that's why I say at the beginning, it's all about people because all people have the same problems and the same hot buttons and the, the same interactions. It could be whole different industries, but still the same stuff comes up. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Um, and when you were building your facilitation skills internally, I've got to ask a lot of people, um, jump into the flip chart and they say, I want to become a better facilitator. Like listen to the podcast, but what are some training courses? Did you go to training or was it more, um, uh, or, and if so, what would you recommend? Um, or was it more about just the time on your feet, getting the experience, um, with a group? I think I could have shortcutted a lot of things by doing some training. <laughs> okay. Um, I, haven't done specific training what I have done quite a bit of is like understanding how people learn and then designing sessions around that so like how where to put activities and how to build for psychological safety and because that's my content that's that's my jam then the facilitation just is just putting a structure around that but I think if people if that is not your content having that as an understanding of how people work is really useful and can save you a lot of time but I don't have anyone to recommend. No, but I, I'm exactly the same as you because I, I didn't do anything sort of official. I did the, um, in Australia, we have something called the Certificate for in Training and Assessment. But there's like a 30-minute module on delivery. Like the, and I'm like, That's, this is like yeah. fundamental. It's really about um, accreditation. So, but in terms of like, I've, uh, same as you, Kate, I've tripped and stumbled. I think I've made a few mistakes and I'm like, okay, don't do that. I've also tried to impersonate my favorite facilitators and that hasn't worked either. So, so it's like, just we've all done that. Well. We've all done that. Yeah. Role modeling off who would be like, did you have role models in the business or external people that you, um, you followed or just crafted your own style? Um, I mean, mine's like a patchwork quilt. Um, there's a bit of everything. And whenever I watch someone facilitate or I listen to a podcast, I'm always thinking, what do I like? What don't I like? Mm -hmm. What's working? What are people picking up on? Where are people getting agitated? Mm -hmm. And so even as someone that's going through the learning experience, I'm learning from the people around me. And then asking the question. One of my favorite questions to always ask at the end, and I'll do it in a one-on-one -on -one coaching session as well, is the question, what was meaningful in this for you? Mm. So really trying to, like, it's twofold. The person gets to really understand their own learning, but it, it helps me to understand where was that moment that's going to stick with them? And it's never what I think it was. <laughs> I know. That is the biggest, like, it's so, I find that so surprising as well because you, you could, like, <laughs> on a personal reflection you think oh wow this part was brilliant everyone connected with it yeah. and I just talk about this other mod model that was you know it probably wouldn't even make your own highlights real I find that fascinating all people would say um that part where you got that thing wrong and then now I know you're human like oh, I connected with you better or yeah. when I walked in you came in and said hello you weren't worried about your slides and I felt like I got to know who you were so I felt safe to ask you a question or like the, the strangest things is what people love. And then there's the humbleness to, all right, that's don't attach my ego to what I thought was wonderful because <laughs> it's not about me. I'm not the hero. I'm there to help them. They're the hero. How can I help them with that journey? Mm -hmm. And so when I start learning what was memorable for them, then I can look at my session design and really start threading that stuff through more. Yeah. I mean, you've alluded to... Um... Yeah. So like, I remember back in 2012, I probably wouldn't do a presentation without my slides. It was like my security blanket. Right. And it was tweaking them into the last minute. Uh, now it's completely shifted. So what kind of mediums do you like to uh, use as part of your learning experience, knowing that you target different learning styles? Yeah. So I rarely will use slides. It depends if I'm doing a virtual, I will use slides because it's a great anchor and people, um, can miss the energy of what's going on in a room I feel I can capture the energy but on a virtual having slides is a great anchor but very very minimal things in there and it will just be the process that I'm going through the other thing is flip charts and I'll prep some flip charts just even with banners of titles or uh, if I'm wanting feedback on something I'll do up a banner put a border around it stick it on the wall like the big sticky flip charts yeah, no. And then people go, ah, oh, so these are the things that we're going to be doing. Um, and the other thing is if I'm working in a room, I'll have a big sheet of 
paper and I'll stick it all the way down the wall or a big whiteboard. And as we go, I'll grab thoughts or ideas that people will have or surface what's not said. Mm. Sometimes a facilitator, it's managing what's said and the energy of what's there, but what's actually bubbling underneath that needs to be surfaced that people want to talk about but don't know how and using a flip chart and a pen or a whiteboard means I can put that on there and it's safe instead of someone saying I have an issue with this I can put it up and say all right see this is one issue what do we think about that issue and they're separating themselves from the issue Mm. yeah okay yeah that's a really smart strategy so rather than like everyone looking at them and then they're they're having to justify it it's like this neutral third party. You got it. Yeah. Everyone just it talks reduces, about. Yeah. It reduces yeah. anxiety immediately. Yeah. I love it. That's where do you get these big rolls of paper? <laughs> we need to link to that in the show notes. <laughs> uh, office works. Yeah. Yeah. There. I have a little suitcase that I take as my workshop suitcase. Um, and I think your question before about like how to set it up, I will have a session plan in mind, but we'll see what happens in the meeting. Mm. Mm. And how do you feel, like, let's just, uh, in the lead up, let's just say you've had a brief from a client, um, the team is really dysfunctional, there's a lot of conflict. How are you personally feeling about that situation, you know, even the night before or the morning of? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. I know it, there's occasions where I've felt anxious about it. Yeah. Um, I think now sometimes the mindset is, well, the only way's up. Mm-hmm. And sometimes having that mindset is great. Um, and also if I... And I... Oh, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I think I've just lost uh, my I microphone. Yeah. Uh, so if I go into a dysfunctional team, the thing that I find to set myself up best is to just open it up with, what's going on because I think you name it that the idea of you name it to tame it Mm. say this looks like it's from what you've said there's a few challenges in here so how open are you to try a couple things out and just see because maybe this is like an experiment we'll have a hypothesis and we'll just let's experiment together Mm. as opposed to being the person with the answers because then that's just somebody else that's telling them what to do or Um, So the first thing is make it as safe as possible because a dysfunctional team does not have psychological safety. How can I do that? How can I position myself that's next to them, not above them or telling them what to do or that something has gone wrong that I'm there? Try to position that this is an opportunity to make things 1% better. Mm -mm -mm. And how do we make 1% better? And sometimes it is just opening up to what's not working and being okay for everyone just to air it. And then once it's aired, we can start moving forward. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. the thing for facilitators to know, it's not dysfunctional, it's not you. Mm. That's not the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's a huge mindset thing, as you said, and, and putting that focus on the group and, and being of service to them, but also not creating that a weird codependent relationship where like you're the hero that's you know sweeping in. I love that you talk about experimenting. I think there's a certain level of playfulness in that as well. Like I always talk yeah. about when I post on LinkedIn, like I don't I have no attachment. I really have no ego. It's like I'm just experimenting with content. If it lands, it lands. If not, like it's it's linked, who cares? It's like it's LinkedIn, but with something like this, though it's if it is at that level and you said before it's where it's it's pretty bad. It's the 1% goal of like just a tiny like shift in that, in a new direction is actually very mm-hmm. powerful. Yeah. And then often people are quite pragmatic and understand compound interest. Yeah. <laughs> so 1% might not seem like much, but let's, let's think compound interest. How might this play out? Mm-hmm. What could be your 1%? And often that might be what I finish with, particularly if it's a tough session. Okay. We're not looking to change the world today. We're just looking for what's your 1%. And mm-hmm. let's, let's work with that. Mm. so being really practical and not pretending to be the white knight <laughs> yeah yeah even though we're like yes we can solve these problems in two hours and yeah i know oh gosh wouldn't that be that wouldn't that be the dream like or an amazing promise um and in terms of like <laughs> managing your own energy as part of like a couple of hours um or an all-day event what are your tips for like um yeah managing that flow in your own sort of presence 
That's a wonderful question and something I'm probably uh, so much more conscious of than the average person because yeah. a part of the challenge that I had was chronic fatigue. Yeah. So, um, and it's quite common people with brain injuries to, uh, your brain just gets tired a lot faster. So your battery runs out quicker. So I need to be so careful on how I set myself up on the day prior, the morning of, during and after. Because if I don't do that well, I will spend two days in bed. Wow. So, and I think this is the same for everybody. It's just heightened for me that I've had to pay attention. Um, so the things that I will do to prep is I will always have an idea of my structure, like the building blocks, but not too specific because then I get too attached to it and I don't listen to the group. Mm. So still to be able to work with them. I always turn up early. I remember hearing on one of your podcasts, like chronic early person. Totally. Hours early. The hotel to open, <laughs> like banging on the door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when people go up on the lift saying, oh, do you mind just swiping me up to... <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I get there early and I set everything up so I know that that is sorted if there's any tech that's sorted and then I can be present in the room and I love to meet everyone as they walk in because that that's building psychological safety it's building those micro moments with people but it's also helping me to not go into a fresh room Mm. and then like be present as much as I can What I find challenging is in breaks, everyone wants to have a chat and I often need a 10 minute walk just to like let everything settle so I can be present again. So oh, like prioritizing that for myself is one of my hardest things. Um, So often in a break, I'll say, all right, so if it's a 10 minute break or a 20 minute break, say, all right, we'll come back at this time. Often I'll put a timer on so they can see how long, particularly if it's virtual. and then say, I'm going to go and recharge myself for 10 minutes. It's a great idea for you to do the same. So I try and model the behavior. Before you jump back into your emails, give yourself 10 minutes just to let this settle. If you've got any questions after that, come up and say hi Mm -hmm. and ask. So I'm telling them what my expectation is for myself and for them. Yeah, that's a that's a great strategy, Kate, because it is hard if you don't separate sort of immediately, like if you're there sort of um, fixing things up and whatever, people will come up to you and then you're going straight into that second session. Like you're not hydrated. You haven't eaten. You're, you're like, what the hell are we even doing after the break? It's um, actually, that's probably a massive benefit of virtual because I, I'm the same as you put the countdown timer on, turn the video off, turn mute. And just doesn't matter what I'm doing. At least I'm just like getting away from the computer. And mm-hmm. but yeah, it, when you're actually in the, in person, it's like to wean yourself away. can be quite tricky when people, because a lot of people that you, you're creating content that, um, and you want to create an open dialogue, but people still feel safer sometimes just coming up to you one-on-one and asking for cool. specific advice. Yeah. Yeah. And I still want to have that open. I, I find I was resenting people. It's like, yes. don't they know that I need, to, well, of course they don't know that I need 10. Like, how would they know that? Like, where have I set up expectations? And as a facilitator, it's all about expectations and how to be able to guide people through that. So like, how do I apply that to make sure that I'm doing that in the off time as well? Yeah, I remember when I was um, when I wasn't a facilitator, I was a participant. I was sitting in these one-day workshops, and I was like so fascinated. Like, how is the facilitator doing this? Because my perception was, uh, I didn't really notice it back then, but like they'd sort of do an, uh, you know, p- provide some content, do a breakout, then we'd do the work. So they got time to sort of switch off around then. But I just it, the assumption was, wow, they've kept this running for a whole day. Aren't they amazing? Um, yeah, and so sometimes the way that I design as well is like. It, Oh, great. It's a 20 minute activity. That gives me a little bit of a breather, <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, Absolutely. this is I've got a big chunky activity now. So I get to sit down at least. <laughs> so, oh, One of my favorite things, um, the think pair share. Yeah. Which is like, like great for introverts and extroverts, because, you know, think about this two moments to yourself and then talk to the person next to you and then we'll share as a group. And I'll be like, okay, so now I've got this time to plan for something or other else. That's it. Yeah. And, and what's so great about that is like, if, if you are in person, like the, the level of energy in the room just like goes yeah. up. There's a guy, Bob Dick, I think he was on one of the earlier episodes, but he talks about um, energy contrast in that if the group brings the energy, you can reduce yours when they're low, then you bring yours up. So we don't have to be yeah. on all the time. Absolutely. I think that's a great lesson. Hmm. Um, with my background, well, not my background, but I'm a performer and musical theater and a singer and I've always presumed I'm the person that brings the energy and that's been a big lesson for me. 
Yeah, same. Well, not that I have. I'm sorry. I'm not a musical <laughs> performer <laughs> at all. But um, I do like, uh, yeah, I thought the whole time I had to be switched on 110%. And like, that's sort of what I've developed. It's like, oh, I don't have to be the whole time. Can you share a bit about your musical history, <laughs> voice, presence? Like how has that impacted your facilitation career? Oh, it has been so fantastic. And I never really, it was, again, not conscious, like the crossover, but it has been so great for me. You're back. It's been so fantastic for me um, because it has helped me be really aware of my presence. What is going on for me? How do I want to include people? And the idea that I'm not the hero. So I, when I think about it in the performance uh, stance, if I am playing a character, I think the presumption is that people come to see you as the character and they want to see um, that but what they're there for is the experience. So as a performer, I'm there to help you feel something through my performance. I'm not there to be the one that is like that has the adoration onto. Yeah. And I think that is something that translates so well. Um, how to help the people that you're working with to experience something. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find my singing teacher is the one of the biggest helps for me as a facilitator um, because of the feedback that singing gives you it's like one extra level than speaking one extra level of vulnerability and openness and feedback and so working with a singing coach we talk a lot about how what is my presence what is my energy how am I working with people and he knows the work that I do and we'll always be looking at like what how does this apply in my work and how does this apply with my clients and how is my energy and what's holding me back it's it's like therapy singing oh my gosh yeah sign me up, <laughs> sign me up for singing lessons um I've, one of my like there's a great youtube clip of jewel i don't know if you've seen it jewel doing karaoke yes i have it's amazing yeah that would be my dream would be like not that i'm a famous uh, musician like jewel but just to be like oh i can't sing and then to get on stage and just after three years of singing lessons and just blow everyone away <laughs> would be um, amazing but I can so Kate you definitely have a real calming presence and like I can tell even uh we're talking virtually but your like breathing rate it just seems at a very calm pace and so I can see that being super effective with the groups um and people that you coach as well if you've got sort of any advice um last question for first time facilitators people that are starting their journey in the world of workshops um what would you tell them um probably the thing that I wish I had known is it's not about me mm. and I think that's useful because we think as the person in the front of the room that we have to do certain things or be a certain way um, and it's stuff that I've talked about during our conversation this idea that you don't have to be the hero like that they're the hero you're there to help from their experience and with that mindset shift it takes away some of the anxiety of, am I going to get it right? What if this doesn't happen? What if that doesn't happen? How to be able to shift that I'm in service to this group versus I need these people to think I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a huge mindset shift. And occasionally it sort of bumps up for me. Like I think. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. So like, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I've got to like settle down. It's like, Leanne, stop over preparing doing all the stuff like just like let you can let some things go and the group will pick it up but you've got to trust that um yeah and I think the more that I do it I get yeah but it does it it does rear its head depending on the occasion if it's something quite different or a new client I feel like I've got to sort of ham it up a bit more so yeah a really good reminder Kate <laughs> thank you um if our listeners would love to get in touch with you find out more about the work that you do see some of your stunning visuals um where should we send them uh, so my website is zenithjourney.com uh, with a Z, Z-E-N-I-T-H, journey. So the idea that the zenith is this northernmost point that you never reach. So it's about continual growth. Um, and so there's a few things on the website, but mostly on Instagram is where you'll see the visuals. Uh, and the other one is LinkedIn. So often I'll share um, something about some neuroscience of why we learn certain ways or this is why people are reacting and I'll draw a sketch at the same time so depending on what your learning style is there's something for everyone yay that's so cool and we'll put a link to a few of those posts on LinkedIn in the show notes as well as well as Kate's contact details Kate it's been so wonderful to meet and connect with you on the show thank you for sharing all your lessons and uh, look forward to staying in touch thanks Leanne